element 112 had finally been confirmed that it had been observed. Um, it's uh, the, one of the densest elements, arguably the densest element. It and iridium kind of have battles over which is denser, but it... If a nucleus gets too big, the strong force can't keep things together and various types of nuclear decay become inevitable. Adamantium, polonium, dilithium, element zero, kryptonite, mithril, netherite, or a calcum, unobtainium. We're fascinated by the concept of fictional elements with extraordinary properties that science hasn't yet uncovered. But could new elements actually exist beyond the periodic table? Well, scientists have recently discovered new elements beyond the periodic table, and their characteristics have left them stunned. So what are the recently discovered elements, and why are they so important? Let's find out. Science fiction often envisions artificial or undiscovered elements with remarkable characteristics that might drive our future into the stars. However, for those familiar with chemistry, this idea seems unlikely. The elements on the periodic table are defined by their atomic number, the number of protons in the nucleus. So how could there be room for new elements? Yes, we could theoretically keep adding protons to the highest atomic numbers, but those elements tend to be extremely unstable and not useful for something like building warp drives. But in reality, there were gaps in the periodic table, atomic numbers that appear to occur naturally. It's possible that the current upper end of the periodic table is just another such gap, beyond which an island of stability might exist, containing elements with useful properties that we've never seen before. To explore the possibility of new artificial elements, let's start with the story of the first artificial element. The story begins when Mendeleev developed the periodic table. He arranged the known elements by their atomic weight and observed that chemical properties recurred periodically as atomic weight increased. We now understand that these chemical properties depend on the number of valence electrons, which increase by one with each additional proton in the nucleus until the electron shell fills and the next shell begins to fill. Although Mendeleev didn't know about protons, he noticed gaps in his periodic table. He correctly interpreted these gaps as elements yet to be discovered, and even predicted many of their properties. Eventually, three of these elements were discovered, filling the gaps with scandium, gallium, and germanium. However, one element remained missing. Located between molybdenum and ruthenium, corresponding to a nucleus with 43 protons. For 70 years, Chemists searched for element 43, but it was never found in nature. It was eventually discovered, but not in the natural world. In 1937, Italian physicist Emilio Segre acquired some molybdenum foil that had been used in Ernest Lawrence's newly invented cyclotron particle accelerator. Now here we have a, um, a mechanical model of the cyclotron, which perhaps might be helpful in understanding how it works. Down, down, down. Down, down. And Segre, along with his colleague Carlo Perrier, discovered that some of the molybdenum had gained a proton, transforming it into element 43. They named this new element technetium, derived from the Greek word for art or craft, essentially meaning a crafted element. Technetium is a silvery gray metal with chemical properties that fall between those of manganese and ruthenium, the elements directly above it and below it on the periodic table. Actually, technetium is created naturally, just like other heavy elements, in the cores of massive stars. These elements eventually end up in planets, forming from the remains of stars that exploded as supernovae. However, technetium is so unstable that by the time Earth formed from the debris of those dead stars, all the technetium had already decayed. A more common term is radioactive, which is often associated with very heavy elements like uranium and plutonium. For those elements, the instability makes sense since their nuclei are massive, making it hard for them to stay intact. But in reality, any element on the periodic table can be unstable. More precisely, every element on the periodic table has unstable isotopes. An isotope is a version of an element that has a different number of neutrons. For instance, a carbon atom has six protons in its nucleus. The isotope of carbon that also has six neutrons is called carbon-12 for its total of 12 nucleons and it's perfectly stable. An atom with six protons and eight neutrons is still carbon, specifically carbon-14, but it isn't stable. One of its extra neutrons tends to convert into a proton, ejecting an electron and a neutrino, which transforms the atom into nitrogen. Carbon-14 has a half-life of about 5,700 years, 
and we find it in nature because cosmic rays in the atmosphere create it when they hit nitrogen nuclei. We refer to carbon-14 as an unstable isotope of carbon. Every element has unstable isotopes, and some elements only have unstable isotopes. For instance, any element with more than 83 protons, as well as unusual cases like technetium and element 61, promethium. There are varying degrees of instability. For example, technetium-97 has a half-life of 4.2 million years, while technetium-96 has a half-life of just 51 minutes. Generally, elements with larger atomic numbers have fewer stable isotopes and shorter half-lives. Elements with more than 118 protons decay so quickly that we've never managed to detect one in a lab. In the end, stability is determined by the balance between protons and neutrons in the nucleus. You might assume that after 150 years of studying nuclear physics, we'd fully understand this. However, the atomic nucleus is so complex that it requires advanced computer modeling to comprehend anything beyond the lightest elements, and many questions remain unanswered. An atomic nucleus is a place where powerful forces are in a delicate balance. On one side, the electromagnetic force is at work, pushing apart the positively charged protons, and this force is strong due to the proximity of the protons. On the other side, the even stronger nuclear force is holding the nucleons together. We've discussed how the strong force binds protons and neutrons. The process of how it binds entire nuclei is more complex. It involves exchanging virtual quark packets, known as mesons, between the nucleons. The specifics of this are worth exploring in detail, but the key point is that the strong force has a short range. If a nucleus becomes too large, the strong force can't hold it together making various types of nuclear decay inevitable. Even though the strong force fades quickly over distance, its strength remains consistent within the short range where it operates. However, the electromagnetic force grows stronger as two electric charges get closer together. This means that electromagnetism can overpower the strong force if protons are too close, leading to instability in the nucleus. This is where neutrons come in. They help to space out the protons so that the strong nuclear force can stay stronger than electromagnetism. For smaller nuclei, with an atomic number of up to 20, an equal number of protons and neutrons tends to be the most stable. But for heavier elements, more neutrons are needed to keep the nucleus stable, with neutron-to-proton ratios reaching 1.5 or higher. However, this is only part of the story. It doesn't explain why adding or removing just one neutron can dramatically affect stability. It also doesn't clarify why there's no stable isotope of technetium. To understand these complexities, we need to look beyond the simple model of the nucleus as a cluster of protons and neutrons. We need to think of nucleons as having energy levels, much like electrons do. You might recall the octet rule from chemistry. An electron shell with eight electrons is stable. This stability is why noble gases don't interact with other elements, as our electron shells are already full. A similar concept applies to nuclear stability, where certain magic numbers complete nuclear shells. These numbers are 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, 82, and 126 for neutrons, and 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, 82, and 114 for protons. The closer a nucleus is to these numbers, the more stable it tends to be. These magic numbers are all even because nucleons pair up according to their quantum spin just like electrons in their shells. One nucleon spins up while the other spins down, resulting in a net zero spin. This spin coupling creates stability, meaning nuclei prefer even numbers of protons or even sums of protons and neutrons. Pairs of up-down nucleons form stable spin-zero partnerships in nuclear pairing interactions. Having an unpaired proton or neutron with an uncancelled spin is generally bad for stability. This helps explain the instability of technetium, with 43 protons, it doesn't match any magic number and isn't even like its more stable neighbors, molybdenum and ruthenium. However, other nearby odd-numbered elements, like silver with 47 protons, do have perfectly stable isotopes. Even giving technetium a magic number of 50 neutrons doesn't solve the problem, nor does having an even total number of nucleons. Why, for instance, does technetium-97 last for 4 million years while technetium-96 decays in less than an hour. It seems that there are other mysterious factors at play beyond neutron padding, nuclear shell filling, and spin coupling. The reality is that there isn't a simple set of rules to determine nuclear stability. 
There are so many factors involved that the only way to understand this is by simulating the nucleus. We've had some success using computational techniques like density functional theory. These models are still imperfect, but they've made many predictions that we've confirmed, as well as some that remain unverified. For example, the island of stability. By combining experimental data with our simulations, we can create graphs like this one. Here, we can identify the magic numbers. Elements with a magic number of protons have more stable isotopes, and there tend to be more isotopes with neutron numbers closer to these magic numbers. Patterns emerge, but not in a way that gives us clear rules for what makes a stable nucleus. As for unstable elements like technetium, they're in unfortunate positions, lacking magic or even numbers of protons. And for complex reasons, no configuration of neutrons can stabilize that unstable nucleus. So, are there elements not on the periodic table that humans can or have created? Yes, there are many. Nature can produce these, but unless that process is ongoing on Earth, like with carbon-14, short-lived unstable elements are extremely rare in nature, only appearing briefly in the decay chain of other, longer-lived unstable elements. The first was technetium, but we've now synthesized 24 artificial elements, filling in Mendeleev's gaps and extending the periodic table all the way up to 118. Oganesson, with a half-life of 0.69 milliseconds. We catch glimpses of new possibilities just beyond the edge of what we know. All we can do is to take a deep breath and leap towards them, aiming to push humanity further in its exploration of space and time. Sugdenium is the 267th element, and it's very amazing. It's mildly radioactive, highly useful in medical imaging, and plays a crucial role in low-temperature fusion. Plus, it glows a beautiful shade of violet. Now let's discuss the Grabby Aliens Hypothesis. This hypothesis suggests that the emergence of new civilizations must be limited at some point. Otherwise, humanity's early arrival in the universe seems too soon. Elia Zion offers a thoughtful critique of using the Copernican principle to argue that we can't be especially early in the universe. To paraphrase, even if the chances of any given civilization being one of the first are low, someone has to be the first. So there will always be one civilization puzzled by why it's so early. This leads to the most debated aspect of anthropic reasoning. If I argue that I should expect to find myself in the most typical circumstances consistent with my existence, what situations does that rule out? Nick Bostrom's self-sampling assumption tries to clarify this. It suggested that all else being equal, one should reason as though they are randomly chosen from a set of all actual observers, past, present, and future, in their reference class. The challenge lies in determining what your reference class should be. For instance, if I consider my reference class as biological beings, it makes sense that I don't find myself in an uninhabitable environment. This allows for the four billion years of habitability before my birth. But why am I in the least harsh period of those four billion years? Is it just luck? If I define my reference class as those who can formulate anthropic arguments, it's less surprising that I live in a modern civilization. However, why can't I define my reference class as those who observe an empty universe? After all, my mental experience of seeing an empty universe prompted these questions. Being a member of an early species aligns with my current experience. While this might seem like a narrow way of defining the reference class, there's no universally correct method for doing so. The anthropic principles remain complex and ambiguous. Tristan Cleveland notes that life may have had the potential to emerge multiple times early on. However, once life started and evolved, it would be challenging for another instance to arise, as the more evolved life would likely outcompete it. The DNA of all life on Earth shows a single common ancestor, suggesting that this dynamic could also occur across the universe. The study discussed implies that the emergence of new civilizations may eventually be prevented, not by being consumed, but because they cannot naturally develop in a universe that's already fully colonized. Some of you were excited by the idea that future civilizations might view us as the ancients. For instance, Medic likes the notion that we could be called the Old Ones with our ancient technology and ruins scattered throughout the universe. Let's aim to be the wise and benevolent kind of Old Ones, rather than the malevolent, tentacled beings from Lovecraftian tales. After all, one possible answer to the Fermi paradox is that the first advanced civilization became cosmic horrors, destroying everything that came after just like life on Earth probably did. If that's the case, then we'd want to be among the first. Better us than them, right? Or maybe we should just hide. 
But of course, this kind of thing leads straight into the dark force theory of the Fermi paradox. The dark force solution to the Fermi paradox posits that advanced civilizations may intentionally avoid making their presence known, out of fear that revealing themselves could lead to their destruction by other civilizations. In this view, the universe is like a dark forest where everyone is hiding, because anyone who makes a noise risks being discovered and attacked by an unknown entity. This chilling perspective suggests that the quietness of the universe might not be due to a lack of civilizations, but rather due to their collective decision to remain silent to survive. This idea is rooted in the concept of self-preservation. Imagine if, upon discovering radio signals from another civilization, a species decides to send a message back. They would have no way of knowing if the civilization they've contacted is benevolent or hostile. And given the vast distances between stars, any response could take centuries to arrive, by which time the original civilization might no longer exist or might be in a completely different state of technological and social development. Therefore, the safest course of action could be to stay silent and observe. On Earth, human history provides examples of what can happen when a more technologically advanced society enters a less advanced one. Often, the results have been disastrous for the less advanced society, leading to its domination, exploitation, or even extermination. With this in mind, it's understandable that an advanced extraterrestrial civilization might choose to remain hidden, avoiding any contact that could bring about its demise. Yet despite the grim implications of the dark forest theory, there's also a possibility that the silence of the universe is simply due to the vast distances involved. Even if there are many civilizations out there, the sheer scale of space and time might make communication between them incredibly difficult. Signals could take thousands or even millions of years to travel from one civilization to another, and by the time a message is received, the sending civilization might no longer exist. Additionally, the energy required to broadcast a signal strong enough to be detectable across interstellar distances is enormous. Civilizations might opt to focus their resources on more immediate concerns rather than attempting to communicate with potentially unreachable aliens. Furthermore, their technology might be so different from ours that we wouldn't recognize their signals even if we detected them. This brings us to the concept of technological disparity. If an alien civilization is thousands or millions of years more advanced than ours, their means of communication could be beyond our current understanding. They might use methods that we haven't yet discovered or developed the capacity to detect. Conversely, they might not see any benefit in communicating with a civilization as primitive as ours, much like how we wouldn't attempt to communicate with an ant colony. Moreover, it's possible that the conditions necessary for the development of intelligent life are far more rare than we currently believe. Life on Earth has persisted for billions of years, but the emergence of a technologically capable species only happened recently in geological terms. If the conditions needed to sustain intelligent life are fleeting or unstable, then civilizations might arise only to be quickly wiped out by natural or self-inflicted disasters. This could explain why we don't see any evidence of them. They simply haven't been around long enough to leave a detectable mark on the universe. Now, please share your thoughts on this topic in the comment section below and stay tuned for more videos.